once upon a time, there was a wolf who'd been looking for prey for days. After spending days going without food, he went, he wandered into a village and there was a crawl. The crawl was full of sheep, but fortified. The wolf could not get in. So he circled around the crawl until he saw a small opening through which he squeezed himself in. Once inside, the wolf had found paradise. He caught the fattest, juiciest sheep he could, he could grab a hold of and feasted all night. He could, have, he could have had just enough, but he couldn't stop himself. So, the, so he ate and ate and ate. When dawn broke, the wolf knew it was time to return to the wild. So it went to the same opening it used to walk in. But this time, it could not fit. So when morning came and the village awoke, the villagers found the wolf trapped and they killed it. Pela Pela Anzum. Moral of the story, you know, greed does not pay in the long run. These are the kind of stories that my grandmother used to tell us. You know, every evening we'd gather around, like waiting in great anticipation, like hold with great suspense every single word she was saying. It was really thrilling. And then I'm reminded of a day, I must have been about 12 years old, and two of my friends had come uh, to pay me a visit. And I had this sandwich of mine that, 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 that I really loved. And they had their eye on it, and I had no intention of giving them. <laughs> and, and my grandmother was watching this from a distance. So as I walk right past her, she says to me, don't be a wolf. <laughs> you know, in, in one instant, I, I, I moved from jealously guarding my, my sandwich like right straight to being embarrassed. You know, I was so disappointed that I was behaving like the wolf in the story. So my grandmother told us stories, and yes, they were entertaining, but that was never the primary objective. She was telling us stories to build characters, to instill values and principles. Till this day, she will always say, the problem with you young people is you think like wolves. Instant gratification, big cars, labels in terms of clothing, but nobody thinks about tomorrow. Go to another world, a different continent, thousands of kilometers away from here, across seas. There's a story being passed from generation to generation. It is based on a belief that the ancestral spirits control the sea waves. The story goes something like, deep in the belly of the oceans resides an evil spirit that thirsts for souls. But before it eats any soul, the ocean would shrink, immediately followed by a gigantic tide that devours everything on, uh, before its path. Now, this was a great story that was, you know, could have been just an ordinary story sh uh, shared by some primitive tribe around the fireplace every evening. Except when 2004 happened, um, the tsunami hit um, the coastline of Thailand, and 8,000 people died, except for a tribe called the Sea Gypsies. They knew the story and believed it. So when they saw the first signs, which was water retreating away from the shore, they went crazy and sick for higher ground. <laughs> so what I find particularly fascinating, though, about the story is that nowhere in recent history had there, had there been a recording of a tsunami that happened in the place. Yet through great diligence, these guys moved the story from one generation to the next until the story became the savior of a tribe. What is the moral of the story in that one? 
I don't know, I'd argue that it's, the, it's about the importance of story in preserving a collective memory of a people. And then let's bring it home. In the 80s, late 80s, um, Beke in Soweto, time of turmoil, I'm reminded of the legend, I grew up in Soweto, by the way, I'm reminded of the legend of Mtsamai. He was the guy that gave the law enforcers like trouble. He was, um, he was a renowned thug, um, dubbed the, the Robin Hood of the township. He stole from the rich, gave to the poor. So, 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 where did, so where has it that one day Mtsamai came speeding down Goma Road, chased by a convoy of police. He, he drove until an open, dusty field. The cops kept with him. He was covered. He was surrounded 60, 360 degrees. Helicopter came in. And um, with all this excitement, um, loud hailers came out. And he was ordered to step out of the vehicle. But instead, he kept revving his BMW 325i. Tembala <laughs> Mahumush. And the police were aiming at him with itchy fingers. The crowd looking, wondering how he was going to slip out of this one this time, when suddenly the car started spinning and it spun and kicked up so much dust, it disappeared into the dust. <laughs> so the police are aiming, the one police guy is aiming at him at this wool wind of dust before him. And he shoots blindly, he's like, bah! And before you know it, everything cuts. So he must have hit the engine. Everything cuts to his deafening silence. And as the dust is starting to find its way back to the ground, the hope is draining out of the crowd's faces. They wonder, is this the last of the Houdini, of the Houdini called Mzamai? The police track in with the greatest of caution toward the car. As the, as the dust reveals the car, the doors open, and Tsamai is nowhere to be found. <laughs> Place erupts with applause and stuff. Now, what I find fascinating about that story is if you ask 10 kids, like 10 kids who grew up around that time who were of my age, what actually transpired in the incident, you would get 10 different versions. <laughs> Right, some people would claim that actually Mtsamai was being shot at even before he got to the dusty road. Like the bullets were, were coming in from the back window. So he opened the door, slide, like uh, lowered his head, driving, guided by the white line on the road. <laughs> <laughs> some would say that Mtsamai was in the crowd, clapping along with his friends while the car was spinning. <laughs> you see, what was happening is every kid took the fattest, biggest fantasy they could dream up and pinned it on their hope, which was Mtsamai. So in a time of despair, Mtsamai became the superman of the township. I mean, I'm hoping that this starts to illustrate how story can be born out of need, but at the same time, the story can serve the need or the problems of a society. I would argue that one such problem in South Africa is HIV AIDS. Um, you know, a lot of stuff has been, has been done on it. A lot of communication has been done on it, and, it, and it's great. But when you're going to do something around that subject matter, your biggest problem is going to be the audience has had it all, this fatigue. And, the biggest, and then the biggest question becomes, how do you cut through the clutter and make an impact? This was the birth of an idea called Intersections, which is a drama series on SABC. Intersections was loosely based around the concept of six degrees of separation. It was, we had illustrated um, a sexual web that connects us all. It's like regardless of your sexual history, once connected to this web, you are its history. We showed how people from all sorts of walks of life that seem to have absolutely, 
that seem to have no business being in each other's spaces. We showed how they were connected. So just, you'd see an episode on a DJ, on a famous DJ, but somehow how he's connected to a truck driver, how they connected to a middle-aged white woman in the northern suburbs, how that's connected to a girl in the rural areas who's never set foot in the city. It, it sent Twitter a buzz. Everybody was talking about it. And, but for me, one of the, of the greatest moments, like a gratifying moment, was when we got an email from a doctor in Bramfontein who had been working in Bramfontein for 15 years and sent us this email saying she had never seen the amount of people coming to test in one day. And this was after like a day, it was the morning after the last episode of the series. And for me, the biggest thing, thank you. And for me, that was a moment because then I was saying, wow, story altered behavior. And that is powerful, right? So times change, problems evolve, um, and stories must keep up too. I mean, the youngest recorded uh, pregnancy in the world now is a five-year-old. Um, there's been reports of an eight-year-old now, like a couple of weeks ago. So the question is then, as parents, shouldn't we be retelling the stories of the wolves so that we can warn our children, shape them, and inspire them without robbing them of their innocence? Shouldn't the societies encourage young people, like, encourage young people to let their imagination soar beyond the limitations of, the re of their realities, like Mutsamai. Shouldn't we as creatives help along with the, com like help the community see a better picture so we can tell a better story? I think we should. Thank you.